Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, Shifting Roles for Museum Educators Embracing Disruptive Technologies. Um, this session is called Educator or EduPunk. Uh, my name is Rosanna Flutie. I'm the Director of Education at Art21. And um, I wanted to mention before we get started, we are using a hashtag for this session at MCN2012EDU. Um, and that we're also being live streamed, which means that any of you who are asking questions, uh, we are gonna do our best to repeat the question, um, but that we would also love to make sure that we have plenty of time for conversation after uh, our presentations. And I wanted to make sure that we took a moment to define edupunk, uh, because this was a term that I gave to my co-panelists, and uh, I think some of them thought that I had made up the term. I had not. This is actually a pretty documented and uh, well-written about movement in the ed tech sector. And, uh, and in fact, the first time that term was ever used by this gentleman, Jim Groom, he's a, um, a technologist and a teacher and a, quite a few people who have embraced this particular uh, term and movement. Um, and the way that we're defining it, I think, for here, or at least when I had first approached these panelists to talk about um, the work that they do, I was really looking at this idea of avoiding mainstream teaching tools, such as PowerPoint and Blackboard. I know the irony of the PowerPoint. Um, but that edupunks bring the rebellious attitude and DIY ethos of 70s bands like The Clash to the classroom. Um, but that the way that we were looking at this for museums is that I really wanted to take an opportunity in a forum like this to think through three goals. Number one, to think through beyond definitions of education in museums that are more expansive than K through 12 education programming. And I say that because I think there are quite a few limitations and assumptions that are made within museums about education departments, uh, both internally and externally, and that this idea could potentially serve, I think, our field in the way that we talk about our work. The second um, is to think, again, a goal for this session is to think beyond object-based learning. And for those of us in education, um, but also for those of us working in museums, I think think very deeply about our collections and about objects. And what you'll see today, I think, will be much more about a, a philosophical stance in how to infiltrate what a museum does. And then the third I'm calling groping for words, and I'm using that term quite lightly, but I'm thinking about it in terms of where we may fall short as a field to not have the adequate language and vocabulary to talk about what we do. Um, sometimes a fallback does and this is now admittedly uh, in a practice that I've had for almost 19 years working in museums, to use a, a fuzzy, passionate language that I think sometimes isolates and um, silos the, uh, the work that I do, or at least I know that there have been moments where I'm not connecting with, say, funders or people who don't think that way. Uh, so that is the third goal for this uh, session. And I'm going to introduce the panelists. They're also going to introduce themselves. Uh, but just to briefly talk, uh, or just mention the three folks that I have assembled today. Uh, Sarah Kennedy, who's the Associate Educator for Lab Programs at MoMA. I know Sarah because she was also working with me on the BMW Guggenheim Lab project last year, uh, which was, I think, in, in many ways thinking through experimentation and laboratory practice that she'll speak about as well. Uh, we have Ryan Hill, who's Director of Digital Learning Programs, Art Lab Plus at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. And then Sandra Jackson Dumont, who's Kyla Skinner, Deputy Director of Education Public Programs, slash adjunct curator, uh, but the Seattle Art Museum. So with that, I think for now, I'd love to turn it over to Sarah. And then uh, we're going to do, I think, 20 minutes each presentation, uh, time for Q&A at the end. But I really do want to get into a, a discussion for, for this panel as well. Uh, sorry, hashtag MCN2012, EDU. Thank you, Rosanna. Hi there. Uh, my name is Sarah Kennedy, and I am an associate educator of lab programs in the Department of Education at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, I've worked on a variety of adult and academic programs, from lectures and symposia to gallery conversations and developing interactive learning spaces on site for all ages. 
Um, to give you some background about what lab programs are, um, or now they're currently called MoMA Studios, they're multidisciplinary interactive spaces that we organize in collaboration with artists and designers and educators uh, to produce drop-in programming uh, and workshop programming that often draws on or takes as a starting point exhibitions that are on display or elements of the collection uh, and concepts that are being explored in those uh, exhibitions. And they aim to engage audiences of all ages by inviting them to learn through participatory or hands-on interactive experiences uh, that involve a variety of uh, traditional and digital technologies within the environments that they occupy, usually in the education building. So to uh, begin, in the last few years, we've been sort of changing our approach and rethinking our approach to how and what we do in the Department of Education at the museum. And the definition of education is really changing, ex changing and expanding as, as was just explained, uh, we're really sort of seeking to provide access in the broadest sense. And so what does the role, what role does the museum play in the development of these new spaces for learning, uh, which don't necessarily play by the rules, uh, so to speak, um, in a tradi traditional classroom sense, our lecture type learning space. Um, this evolving approach to education involves disrupting and shifting certain parts of existing program, uh, public program formats at MoMA and sort of rethinking our, our practice and our, our process as educators and what it means to teach and learn in these informal learning environments. Um, of, of a museum space. Uh, so we set out to create a space where ideas are exchanged and experimentation becomes paramount and is welcomed on the part of the educator and the visitor and taking and the learner. So taking all of those into consideration. And this disruptive process involves flexibility, a certain amount of transparency and openness to make room for creativity and uh, experimentation. So just like developing an app for the first time, uh, one you know, makes a prototype and then relies on feedback from users to, to improve and fine tune that experience. And this process that my team at MoMA has undergone depends a lot on collaborating with colleagues across the museum and with other educators and artists that we invite to be part of the discussions, um, as well as sort of balancing the interests that we learn about our audiences through, through um, evaluation and feedback. Um, and being really realistic about our resources and our priorities um, within, the, within our charge at the museum. So I, I'm going to try to attempt to break this down through case studies that have relied on this disruptive process uh, and demonstrate the impacts on how our publics are learning in these museum spaces. Firstly, I'm, I'm going to think about the environments where disruption is taking place and where learning is taking place on site and, and online. So these interactive spaces, the interventions in the education building and in the galleries, and online courses. Secondly, the, the learner-educator-artist relationships have been disrupted, and there's a changing dynamic between the roles of each of these um, within the museum context. And then thirdly, the tools and resources that educators are using to teach are being applied in new innovative ways uh, through, the, through the programming. So there's a lot of crossovers between these three elements, but I will, uh, I will, I will begin with environments. Uh, so since, since 2009, we have produced a series of interactive lab program spaces, now called MoMA Studios, which I mentioned earlier. And these spaces are multi-sensory, experience-driven environments, which uh, is, are designed uh, to offer ways to engage learners in new ways within the museum. Based on the idea that learning in the galleries is different than learning in uh, a participatory hands-on space, the aim is to offer opportunities for engagement that approach learning from different points of view and, and the behaviors of learners and considering those. So they often involve art making using traditional digital technologies. They encourage interaction, creating and playing with objects and digital platforms. Um, in this slide, you're seeing here uh, a collaboration with Reggio Children, which is an organization of educators in Italy that develops pedagogical experiences for toddlers and preschools in a region called Reggio Emilia. And to develop this particular project was, uh, is taking place at MoMA currently. And it was really to develop a projection light-based installation that visitors are encouraged to build upon this landscape and the imagery and explore the effects of light from various points of view. So visitors are welcome to investigate video components and digital simula simulations in, within the three-dimensional space by manipulating an array of diverse materials. 
and they see their actions contribute to the evolving environment in the space in real time. Uh, the spaces also involve cumulative and generative experiences, sort of community building through these offerings. Um, they encourage transforming a space into a multi-sensory environment. And so this, this, what you're seeing right now is a scene from Common Senses, which is the most recent MoMA studio. And it, it was produced in conjunction with an exhibition called Century of the Child, Growing by Design, 1900 to 2000, which explores the intersections of education, design, and art um, and aims to off foster our evolving relationships with nature and technology um, and everyday surroundings through community interactions and play. Um, we invited art um, an artist, Jay Morgan Poot and Mark Dion of Mildred's Lane and the Mildred's Complexity, um, which is an artist uh, living, working, and researching community and experiment that has unfolded over the last 12 to 15 years in, uh, on a farm in Pennsylvania. And they're really centered on developing a new approach to holistic living and pedagogy. And it's really a generous community of, of artists that convene and share and work and learn together with the goal of, um, quote, co-evolving a radical pedagogical strategy about aspects of living as the critical focus, rigorously tuning a turning over the everyday. So they see life as the studio and being as practice. So we invited them to come to MoMA, and what you're seeing right now is actually one of the corners of the mezzanine space, which is in the downstairs area of the education building at MoMA. And they literally intervened and installed a living archive there, which is currently in, in action um, within the space. And it's act activated by regular daily visits by, which we call swarmings, by the artists that are part of this community that come and share and involve the communities that come in to talk about their practice and engage with their practice and learn about their practice within this space. So these are instances of us attempting to sort of evolve modes um, and behaviors of learning by offering new approaches to engage learners through this multi-sensory participation. We're also sort of thinking about this disruption of the learner, educator, artist relationship. And through much of the programming, we've been rethinking about sort of the dynamic between teacher-student or, or learner-educator and attempting to disrupt the hierarchy, so to speak, of um, realizing that we can create and foster product productive learning environments where the level exchange happens across various abilities, various interests, various levels of participation, and um, what participants bring to the table. So we wanted to sort of disrupt, as, as Rosanna mentioned, this thinking that museum education is all you know, equals object or collection-based instruction, but, but that rather it's thinking beyond this definition, we're sort of challenging the idea that let's look at ideas, let's look at open-ended concepts that demand questioning and collaboration that, that take on a lot of perspectives and that make room for a lot of different perspectives um, from these, these three different groups that we're, that are, we're constantly in dialogue with. Um, so by bringing new perspectives like the artist into bringing them to the table, we're all constantly sort of rethinking and being challenged to broaden, disrupt, um, and change our practice in certain ways. And, uh, and th th these relationships between the learner, educator, and artist sort of open up. Um, this is what you're seeing on, on the one side here uh, between where artist educator is, is a workshop that was last year at the last studio, which was called Print Studio, where it really explored the evolution of print practices um, from traditional techniques to, to uh, new digital technologies. And we invited an artist, George Colombo, to come. And he uses his iPhone and his iPad to draw using a very simple app called Brushes. And he came in and, and taught people how to do this. So the sessions were, were helping to build skills, but also there was, a, there was an exchange between the artist showing how he did it and the people who used this or were learning how to use it, showing new, new ways that they were, they were applying these technologies to, um, to create their own practice. And we had age group, a range in ages from 8 to 80. So it was a really sort of interesting um, and, and repeating uh, workshop. MoMA's online courses also offer a new definitions for outreach and community and responsibility to the uh, audience for the ins and for the institution at large. And there's sort of an, uh, an openness and transparency where innovation is not just top down. So there's collaborations with other departments across the museum to come up with um, the content. Um, and really, initially, these, these courses um, began with uh, object-based 
videos and text supporting ideas that were presented through the collection. And they've sort of evolved towards exploring ideas and themes that are, that are currents that are through art history and offering jumping off points for learners so that the conversations that um, the teachers bring to the course are letting the students complete the conversations. And sort of this open-ended discussion, less about finding the right answer, but more about what's your idea about this? How do you feel about this? And fostering that discussion over the course of the, uh, the course. Of the course. <laughs> um, one really, really quick element that I want to bring to uh, the fore, too, is this idea of conversation and exchange online and on site. A new recently developing initiative that we're, we're talking about in, artist, uh, in um, adult and academic programs is an initiative called Artists Experiment, uh, where we're endeavoring to create a, a new space for reflection on our practice as educators by inviting a group of artists, four selected artists, to work with us on a sort of transparent, disruptive process of rethinking our practice as educators. So we've given them sort of the menu of programs that we work on on an annual basis, and we're asking them to think about what they would do if they had an opportunity to collaborate with us on changing some of those formats and in inserting different content into them. Um, and so this, it's a, a sort of a, a collaborative, challenging back and forth process that we've begun. We began this summer and we're going to be producing this programming in the winter and spring. Um, and it's sort of showing them a behind the scenes of our work so that they can react to it and engage with our concerns as educators um, as we consider and make space for their ideas to sort of collectively and together embark on this new way of pushing ideas forward to the fore. Um, and rethinking also with fresh eyes the, the formats that we, that we produce and, and open up our public programming to, to the audiences that we serve. Uh, the, the third thing that we are disrupting, these tools and resources, you know, how are we rethinking how we teach and how do these tools and resources and the use of them um, affect the way that we're, we're teaching? For me, um, I guess we, we have, how can we use our resources to carefully conceive, produce, and offer our public something new and unique to the institution's content? Um, and for me, this is not and certainly within the work that I do um, currently with the, with the interactive spaces that are mostly on site, this is not about using new technologies and inserting fancy devices into the practice in every way we can, but really about being creative about the technologies that we do have and being deliberate, uh, thoughtfully considering how we might enhance content or learning platforms for our audience um, by asking, you know, what behaviors do we want to support uh, and preserve and provide opportunities for learning and skill building, and how can we use those technologies to help us in that, that, that goal? Um, activities that engage people in making and critical thinking and reflection um, and play come up a lot and are of interest to us. Uh, and we try to produce programming that will offer a variety of entry points for an access to participants to appeal to their type of learning and how their behavior suits different modes of learning. Uh, oops. Um, this is another uh, image from Print Studio, the last interactive lab space, which uh, offered a, a rich resource for inspiration, uh, the Reanimation Library, which uh, is a collection of many discarded books that were used as resource materials uh, for visitors to make their own prints. It was, all of these spaces currently are completely free, and you can access them through the education department entrance that is different from the museum entrance, um, which is a, which is a, a really uh, important part of, of this open access that we're trying to provide and, and welcoming new ideas from all audiences. Um, so people came in and made their own prints using a variety of these, these materials. What you're seeing here is one of our facilitators teaching, showing a, a family how to scan something that they would have drawn um, on one of our Photoshop places. And in the background, you're seeing different, different uh, prints that people have made that were exhibited on the wall for the duration of the studio. So people were invited to manipulate these images through a variety of technologies from scanning to photocopying, printing, um, photoshopping, cutting, collaging. And they could choose to take their print home or leave it on the wall, uh, adding to this evolving visual environment. Uh, and 93, we did a lot of evaluation of this space, and 93% of the people who came to Print Studio reported making something and enjoying making something in the space. Uh, 
and that it, it added to their experience, not only whether they'd visited a, a print exhibition that was on the other part of the museum, but this was something where they could actually get their hands on. It was a different type of learning experience for them. So you're seeing here the, the Photoshop um, areas where people could uh, manipulate the images that they were scanning, and then more uh, putting things on the wall and uh, the, the wall that was the, the dots continued to expand down for space. So uh, online courses are also a really great way, um, example of rethinking um, how MoMA can access, be accessible and helpful to a wider international audience who wants to understand modern art better. Um, where the galleries provide the, the visible, physical objects, uh, courses are offering a platform to let these ideas be the focus to be discussed and untangled, opened up, um, and used in different ways across various levels. MoMA online courses enable students to share what they're making in real time, what they're seeing, images that they happen to see that remind them about um, something that was, was brought up in a discussion class the week before. Um, and the technology enables this exchange to be documented and uh, recorded and archived as it happens. Um, so this is a process that has, has shown to provide the, the comments and the dialogue that happen in, these, in this sphere end up being more thoughtful because they're going to this, this archived place that is going to last through time. Um, people are taking more time to think about what they want to say and add it to that conversation. So th these courses also make MoMA accessible to anyone who's not physically able to come to the museum, whether because of geography or any other reason. Um, and and they can also work through them at their own pace. So there's a lot of advantages that that technology and the way that we're using that tool helps the, the learning, depending on what people's behaviors are within, within that, that space. Um, the, on the, the online courses become a place where we can reach new interested audiences and bring the world in. Uh, this is, this is a, a slide that's showing you really which top international countries are, are um, enlisting in courses. So we're seeing that we're, we're almost at 2,000 students from 61 countries across the world. And uh, this, is, this is something that, a lot, again, increases this idea of community and dialogue and conversation and using these tools and creating an environment online where this type of exchange can take place. Um, and these are really, courses are not really trying to replace uh, established art history models of schools or universities, which have their own communities and goals and content and language. But this is really MoMA thinking, what is it that we can offer online what is it that MoMA has that, that is a resource related to content that, that won't happen in any other way? And how can we offer something new and an alternative um, access point uh, for interactive learning experiences? Um, and one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that the formula, both for these interactive spaces and for these online courses, um, are not simply content plus technology. So pedagogical thinking is really essential to craft the environment socially, digitally, conceptually, and, and, and the responsibility that we have as educators to, to offer a range of types of engagement for these different people that are learning with us. Um, digital platforms and mobile devices are one thing, but developing this rigorous content is critical, and it's not formulaic. There's no out-of-the-box solution. Each time one of these is created, it's really from the bottom, and we think about the process in a new way, depending on that content. Um, and again, it's what can MoMA do online that no one else can do online because of what we have as our resource. Um, and uh, I guess thinking about one of the things that's come out of both the, the lab spaces and the online courses is this idea that transparency becomes very important. Because these are not uh, television shows that we can pilot or um, focus group situations, we have to launch these things into the world and, and really listen and hear about the feedback that our, our visitors bring to us. And so people who are taking part in these courses, for instance, um, understand that it's not a perfect product, but they're, they're part of it as a work in progress. And being invited to realize that and be active participants in that is a uh, uh, an excited thing, uh, an exciting thing for them to be a part of, and and again, it's this breaking down of the learner educator um, artist relationship. 
and inviting uh, sort of the process to loosen and evolve the model of each of these courses and content to think about it thematically in discussion-based ways and, and let it become something that is a, an organic thing. So I guess I just want to finish quickly with some f sort of outcomes. Um, the feedback that we're getting from our audiences through evaluation and research really shows that community building is happening. There's, there's a tremendous amount of uh, positive feedback from the, the community that is a part of these, these, uh, these courses and the spaces on the, in the, in the on-site environments. And there's an assemblance of kind of um, an assembling of community and new friends across distance, across time and language and practice. Here are some quotes from uh, students who are part of uh, the courses that you you see that there's a there's a certain level of satisfaction for them from the interaction and from the the depth and the 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 uh, richness of content that they're being that they're being afforded through the courses. We are also seeing that they're continuing to converse and expound these relationships online after the course, but also learning about each other. You're seeing here that they love the course and that they're checking in about something, somewhat, something happening in their lives. So there's, there's a community that's developing that's outside of just the art history content or the studio content that's being produced. Um, we're also seeing, uh, in recent years, enrollment. Um, we're getting positive feedback that they are their there's attendance is evidence that studio that that um, the studio courses and enrollment online are attracting and serving our audiences in a way that they continue they continue to come back, um, and in this in the experiences of studios research and evaluation shows that people are actually coming to the museum and seeking experiences when they find that they can come and make something and and further deepen the experience that they may have had in the galleries by getting their hands involved in something and, and trying something out, they are, they're happy to do that, to be creative and to be interactive and to have, to have agency in designing their own experience and what they leave or decide to take away. Um, finally, I just wanna mention that within these spaces, there's sort of self-organization that's happening outside the course even after it's over. So we have a, here a Facebook group that was, uh, that was designed by students that were part of a studio course that lives on and continues to be very active online. They share their work and they share their ideas, they share their inspiration. And then here is actually a blog post, one of many, many that was made by a, a woman who came almost daily to Print Studio over its six week run and became part of a community of regulars that, that were artists that uh, continued to expand their practice through this free access to things that they would not otherwise be able to experiment as much with. So I just want to leave you with the um, idea that I guess I, I think our, our practice as educators involves creating the right conditions uh, to allow and to empower visitors and learners to have an agency to enable them to contribute to their own environments and to the learning process. I think our practice is to think creatively about the ways that we can do this and how we can you know, resourcefully encroach and interrogate and challenge uh, and go beyond, think outwardly, push the envelope in all the ways that we possibly can to better serve the institution's mission and the public that we are here to serve. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think one thing that is coming up for me, at least as you're speaking, is that it's really difficult to predict the motivations that these audiences have. And because they're so diverse and they're coming, especially with the online courses, from all over the world. Um, and of course, language, I think, in that instance becomes very interesting to me because the assumption that everyone speaks English, I'm sure that they do not. So the fact that these are also being um, potentially platforms for I mean, it just seems like there's such uh, enormous potential to explore what the motivations are for people to join these types of programs. Um, I wondered, should we, I'd like to take one or two questions. I'm gonna set, I've set the timer um, before we pass it on uh, to Ryan. Does anyone, would anyone like to ask a question? I'm, I'm happy to take questions now, yes. It's interesting with, with MoMA Studio programs that are on site, we, we, depending on the offering, and again, it changes depending on what the studio is, the, fo the focus of the studio is, 
we have uh, the print studio was mostly middle-aged artists, but on weekends when there tends to be more families who have time together, we have full families that come through. So uh, the and then the MoMA Studio Common Senses that's currently up has a, a great focus on play, and because it was in conjunction with an exhibition that was focusing on children, we tend to have a lot of children. But then we're we're trying to constantly challenge adults when they come with children and children when they come to, with adults to grow and learn and, and explore these spaces together. So it, we never know on any given day who's going to be coming to the museum to explore. They're open for four hours a day from 12 to 4 every day that the museum is open. So it is also for during the work week for the four days that it's open exclusive of Tuesday when one was closed. It's a hard time for some people to get away. Um, but for Prince Studio, for instance, this was a time when people who work at home and were practicing artists came and they, they had a, it was a respite for them to come and learn. So it varies very much depending on the offering um, and it varies on what their motivations are that they come for. The, the idea is that it's there, that it's free access, that we have a facilitator who can help to prompt questions and, and try to facilitate the learning depending on what their, where the, what their interest is. We'll take one more, yeah. Uh, I'm supposed to repeat the question. The question is about the development process you know, and how to develop these types of engagements. We, we work uh, on pretty short timelines and we work often with curators to have sort of arch or overarching ideas that relate to an exhibition or a concept. Um, but then we also work very closely with the artists that we collaborate with to come up with goals together about what we hope the learning will be, what the interaction looks like. Um, and then we also have a, a, a fellow that we work with that, that we identify and, and apply sort of research questions to figure out that evaluation process to find out. And sometimes it's not what we set out to do is not what we find to be exactly what it is. But um, it, again, it's a flexible, evolving process. Thank you. So next up we have Ryan. I'm gonna actually let you take this one. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Well, hi everybody. Can you hear me okay if I talk about this level? Good. Um, <clears throat> thanks Rosanna for inviting me. When she said it was edupunk, I thought that's great because then I can just be kind of sloppy and that would be okay. So get ready for that. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm very excited to talk about this program. Um, it's been around since um, uh, October 2011. But before I do, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm the director of digital learning programs at the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Um, hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but my background has been working with adult audiences for about 20 years, and um, mainly about gallery interpretation. And I've always been interested in interpretation and informal learning in galleries. And um, so it's interesting that I'm working now with teens. Um, but, and, and that digital media is, um, I guess I say, is a, is a newer um, language and medium for me to be working with. Um, I've always been doing object-based interpretation with them. Um, the other thing I think that's um, interesting for me is that um, I've always, because I'm interested in informal learning, um, I'm always trying to create visitor experiences that are um, uh, responsive to what people need. And so it's led me to do all kinds of different programs through my career. And this one has been really interesting in terms of, um, of um, being able to do that. It's given me a lot of chance to do it. So, oh, and there I am. I was supposed to do that when I was. Uh... All right, so this is the back of the Hirshhorn Museum. Um, and we actually, the, um, the art lab is uh, in the sculpture garden. So it's actually away from the museum, which has allowed us to be a little bit under the radar, which has been very helpful. Um, and you can see the little orange arrow there. So the museum's above, the Lichtenstein is in the middle, and then there we are. It originally was a, um, a pathway that went from the garden to the plaza. And then in the 80s, there were a lot of homeless people that were there. And then um, they decided to make it a learning center. 
So um, that was that's kind of an interesting evolution in terms of uh, education at the at the uh, museum. Um, I um, I see Art Lab as being a, an artist collective made up of um, local teens facilitated by digital artists and museum educators. And the program is housed in the museum's sculpture garden, which I've seen here. It's open every day, except for weekends, from 3 to 7. From 3 to 5, um, it's called um, Open Studio. And what Open Studio means is that um, teens can come in, they can use any of the media and to, um, to do whatever they want. It's very open, right? It uh, allows them to Facebook, they can play video games. There are no institutional directives for them to be in the space, and the space is free. From um, five to seven, it's artist studio. That's where mentors are more a part of the whole development of it. They, um, they help teens with individual um, creative projects. There is some um, facilities they facilitate production teams, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. They lead workshops, and they do critical reviews of the teens' works. Um, a lot of this has been, um, yeah, I'm going to do it after this. Yeah, um, a lot of this has been um, uh, shifted my identity as an educator, and um, part of what I was able to do by looking at MacArthur research. Um, is to have a philosophy, to have research that was based on a, a three-year ethnographic study by Mimi Ito, um, to found my project, uh, my, to find um, Art Lab, to, to, to base Art Lab um, Plus in. And that really helped kind of support and give me a language to communicate why this was necessary to do, and that, of course, there was funding behind it as well, but that there were people um, outside of perhaps our, the, the siloed feel of, 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 of the museum looking at doing this. So when we talk about um, kind of some of the theory that I, I got to use this way, it, it was actually very useful for museum education. So if we look at this, there's hanging out, messing around, and geeking out. And within the research, it's called Homago. And what uh, MacArthur um, has started to do is fund spaces that use Homago principles in order to create what are called different genres of participation. What the research has shown is that teens participate with digital media in different sorts of ways that range from um, friend-driven to interest-driven. Now, what's interesting about this is that a lot of times uh, the geeking out is where the museum really is invested. And it's because the people who are working in the museum are geeking out. They want to see their audiences geek out, too. But the audience isn't always like that. The audience is often coming for social reasons, or they are experimenting and opening themselves up to it. So this social aspect of learning has been left out a lot of times in the museum. And that's what um, this opportunity and this philosophy allowed me to do in my programming. So it's this continuum. It's an entire ecology of ways that people participate using digital media, the ways people learn, and ways people interact with our museum content. And it doesn't look the same as a lot of the different ways that people were um, um, making programs in museums before. So this is weird. Oh, I know why you said that to me. Thank you. Um, so that's the philosophy. Now I'm going to show you what it looks like. No, that's not doing it. It's not at the bottom. Oh, down here? Yeah. Wait, now I just. So obviously, the director of digital media doesn't know very much about digital media. <laughs> All right, I don't know. Yeah, come on up. I think we just need to. I'm going to actually back it up. Oh. And there's no sound. He can't hear me, but that's DJ Death on the decks right now. All right, I'm going to show you guys what's going on inside the art lab. Lots going on today. All right, we got Preston. He's working with some people on lyrics. Two minutes if I want to. He can't. 
Can go lay these shots. He can't hear me, but that's DJ Death on the deck right now. For another one. Yeah. All right, what are you guys doing? Getting booed up. Preston, he's worked with some people in lyrics, we got iPads, and then we got some people in the booth back here. Actually, they just stepped out. All right, so that's what's going on in the R lab today. We got what? We got two minutes before I go in the booth. We go lay these tracks down. Back again for another one. You hear me? All right, what are you guys doing? Getting beat up. <laughs> We got iPads, and then we got some people in the booth back here. Actually, they just stepped out. All right, so that's what's going on in the R lab today. Okay. So let's... Oh. All right, so um, that's basically a video diary that we were doing every day for a while, just to get an idea of what was happening. And as you can see, a lot is happening. I'm kind of glad that I set up the philosophy first so that you can kind of see that there is some principles going on there. It's not just complete chaos. Um, it, one of the things that kind of comes up when I have to talk about this is not only do I have to have a language to describe um, the principles this is found in, but I have to be able to justify why a museum, an art museum, would do something like this. Um, I need, this is an after school drop in program with underserved teens, basically 56% are from Anacostia. Um, they are people who never come to the museum, so it's really an interesting thing, and they're not necessarily always interested in art, which is another thing. Um, so, a lot of the questions that it brings up for me. Um, go back to some of the things that I was thinking about when I was an informal educator and had to use all kinds of languages to talk about what I did with, with the public so that it would be um, considered um, uh, an expertise that I could do. I had to look at languages of psychology, languages of anthropology, languages of, of ethnography, um, marketing, um, uh, all kinds of ways to talk about what happens between people when they're when they're learning. And that's because informal, informal learning is always is, is a little hard to kind of measure and to show. And yet, what it does is it really impacts what the museum does. Um, the questions it brings up for me are, what, do, what, do you, what does it mean for youth groups to use technology to represent their own interests within the context of the museum? How does, um, outs, uh, how does outside authorship and interpretation challenge how museums present their collections? How does... Um, this redefine the work that we do. If we're no longer necessarily the experts on their experience, then and they become and, and they, they inform what we do, that's a very different working relationship that we start to have with our visitors. Um, and also, what does it mean to have youth um, voices represent um, museums, um, represent themselves um, on museum websites and um, in museum galleries? And one of the things I often say um, when we talked about mobile technology is our visitors are already using these tools. They're already using mobile technology to represent our museum. And so what we need to do is also use it. It's really that simple. And when we're talking about people are already representing our institutions, we may as well incorporate that into our identity. So we become more about a forum for ideas and less about necessarily um, our objects. Now, that's a whole other question about contemporary art. I see contemporary art as really about ideas, and the objects, in some ways, are held together by the gl that glue, the glue of the ideas. Um, Homago principles I've already talked to you about, but I think what's really important is that, um, that some of those ideas challenge the ways that um, the infrastructure of the museum sees itself in relationship to its audiences. Um, so that was Open Studio, and when we talk a little bit about um, artist studio, one of the things is the use, the incorporating of um, youth voices into what we do and listening, doing surveys, having kind of town hall style meetings to hear about what they're interested in and seeing how that works with our agendas. Uh, agenda. So there's a kind of compromise there. Um, these are just some photographs of the video gaming that can happen. Um, the ways that we see different kinds of um, interactions in the space, they don't always look like learning per se, but there's a social aspect to learning and there's a comfort level that's created with not only the art but the institution when kind of, um, these, these kinds of ways people interact are allowed. Um, but we also see, we saw a lot of Facebooking. 
Um, and then also, too, there's the mentor relationship that's really important to, these are artists, educators, um, people from uh, a digital background, from an education background, working with teens, to have them be able to realize their own projects. Um, and I'm just gonna go through these. What I often found was the model of the community center became something much more kind of akin to what I was doing. And so I think it became very important for us to start to think about how to tie that into, um, how to tie that into um, the, the museum. So we work often during artist studio um, times from five to seven with themes, and themes that are connected to the um, exhibition. So part of what our mentors work with with these themes is they create workshops or they create um, challenges. One of the, 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 our challenge right now is called um, Questions Hit. And Questions Hit is actually based on two exhibitions we have up right now, Barbara Kruger and um, also um, the Ai Weiwei exhibition. Both people who questioned authority, excuse me, who questioned authority in order to find their own sense of voice and to reflect on their own perspectives um, of their world. So um, we use that artwork, those, um, those exhibitions as inspiration. Um, but then we also are saying, but we want to hear from you now, what you question. And what that becomes at the end, I think November 1st is their, um, their time to, um, to submit. We have a Dropbox. They just kind of throw their stuff in there. Those th things in that Dropbox are then um, on every Friday up for review. So we all talk about it as a group in a critique. Um, and, when we, and when we do that, it also allows us to get back to the content of the exhibition. So that's kind of great. And also to, to hear how they're relating to that content. But also, um, once, once, the, once people kind of make it through those crit period, there's going to be a time where they can then be part of a mixtape. And this mixtape will actually be available to our visitors through the museum's lobby. Um, so these are just examples of activity centers. These are centers that we, and you may have seen in the video, that are kind of just set up. Um, equipment set up on tables for people just to interact with. They're very free form in that sort of way. But the idea is the mentor is there then to kind of um, customize the experience for them. And there's also something very interesting happening, which is I've been only running this for about a year, but already there are teens that self-select themselves as peer mentors. And so there's peer-to-peer -peer learning that goes on. And so the authority of the museum actually gets displaced by its own audience. And the audience starts to use the machine that we've created with our programming. And so what I start to do is I'd be able to start to find new staff members, you know, funding, you know, <laughs> funding, uh, considered that can actually start to reflect more and more the community that's using the space, and I just I, and I also want to say that there's there, people interact with this programming in all sorts of ways because it is open ended, and this is one of our critical reviews. Um, but what I wanted to show was kind of the individual working on one's own projects and then also the way people come back together as groups. And when I talk to my mentors, I often say that what we're doing is we're building communities. We're, it's about community building. We don't tell them what the community is. We don't say come into our community. We say we have the resources here and that we want to see what you do with them. And we learn from you as to what works best for you to interact with our content. All right, the biggest challenge that I'm facing now is that we're going to actually bring this education program into our lobby. And we've been working for about three years now with the architectural firm Dillis Graffiti and Renfo. And recently, we're bringing in um, local projects to do an interactive um, piece of this. But what that means for me, now that I'm not under the radar, now that I'm not under Jefferson Avenue, is that um, we're going to be um, looked at far more um, by the institution in terms of how we serve um, how we serve their needs. And so um, uh, that's a very interesting question for me. Um, we will continue with doing our production teams and our workshops, but even just a sign of this was, well, we thought that we might have kind of um, a social space for the teens in the um, lobby and that they could play video games, right? Um, and there was, that was pretty much like video games in the lobby, no. And I talked about it as visual art and that the ways that teens are looking at video games is the same way they might look at visual art. And, um, but, but what it comes down to is you have to compromise. There are constraints that my institution gives me that I work with. And we actually, when we do production teams with the teens, we say when you're working with um, a client, 
that client has constraints you have to work with. And so this is a great example. So the teens are working with the architects to work within these um, constraints. They are a task force to help kind of develop the project. And it's a great learning experience. So to bring the teens actually in to the whole process of building the space, I think, will be um, a way that they get ownership and also the way that we can learn from our audiences. And, um, and also, I think, um, uh, kind of a building a new kind of museum. The idea that the museum is never done, that it's always in process, and that your audience is keeping your collection alive um, is, is kind of the way that I've been thinking about this. Um, the way that this works is it's um, Quinn's Milan furniture, which is high density fo foam. It works like kind of uh, uh, how teeth fit together. The ceiling, the, 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 the furniture actually kind of gets hired up into the ceiling. Um, and kind of fits in like that, and then it gets lowered back down. And that was because we wanted to be able for um, openings and receptions to be able to get rid of the furniture. All right. So just to, to conclude, um, uh, I, I, I've both been very lucky by being under the radar to be able to investigate all these ideas and really to kind of um, to work collaboratively collaboratively with my audience to find collaborators within my institution who want to challenge the infrastructure, who want to see different ways that we can respond to our audience. Um, and at the same time, I'm kind of on the brink of, um, of asking those kids who've been having um, that ownership and inviting them into a living room basically covered with plastic and saying, OK, now sit down and behave. So my next challenge will be, how do I start to ask those questions in ways that are meaningful to the staff that I work with at my institution? So they understand that, well, to, have, to actually want to have, for, for that audience to want to be in there, not only are they wanting to be able to play music, but they may want to eat. You know, they may want to um, talk loudly. They may want to do their own kinds of um, do their own kinds of events that might be different than ours. And so that's a new challenge for my institution, and something that keeps my job exciting. Um, I keep thinking about that tension between representing what the institution wants, what you as a practitioner wants, but then, of course, where you were working with teens who are already so invested in your organization, what they want. And yeah. at the end of the day, when you're setting up a series of programming where there's a peer-to-peer -peer learning happening, it becomes riskiest, I think, to usurp what you've already built with representing teens' voices. So to bring them into the process of planning the space is really quite yeah, extraordinary. It was, yeah, it was yeah. important. There um, were some things I didn't get to in terms of my audience, but uh, if people want to ask that. <laughs> well, are there, are there questions from the audience? You wanting to know about the funding? Yeah. I'm just repeating the question. Um, uh, you know, when I see um, when I see presentations like this at conferences, I always think about funding too. <laughs> and um, it's been pieced together from many different funders. Uh, it was initially started three years ago with a Pearson Foundation grant that helped us create workshops using um, smartphone phones as a mobile learning program. Um, one of the things I learned from that that was really great was rather than create the materials for the teens to use, have the teens create their own materials and we would work with them. And that was a great learning process and that led to our involvement with the MacArthur Foundation which actually funded the space that you saw and the equipment. Along the ways came the Knight Foundation which works, off, like Pearson, works a lot with the MacArthur Foundation. And then also we have a, a youth access grant um, through the Smithsonian which is funded by the Gates Foundation. We also have some money from ESA, which is the Entertainment Software Association. And um, I have to say, this is an expensive program. Um, and it's an expensive program that can be done at a, to be done at a contemporary museum because things got to look good, right? But I think also that you can make programming like this in analog sorts of ways. It's really, for me, the ideas that ground this programming um, that make it um, unique. And I think. Libraries have been doing this for a long time. So I got, I'm sorry, I got a little, my editorializing in there. Okay. Sorry, do you mind if I just follow up? Sure. I think that seeing sort of the response that the sort of kids have to this, do you think they're less likely to maybe um, uh, use some of the operating budget to fund maybe some of the, uh, the facilitators? 
it, it's all really dependent on the priorities of the director, and um, and the director is super supportive of this. Um, but this director also has um, some other initiatives that he's focusing on. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, should we do one? We'll just do one more. Yeah. Uh, Mm-hmm. When, for, when I do training with my mentors, I draw a big funnel, and I say, at the top of the funnel is people who are socially interest, interested, and then by the bottom of it, you get those little drips, and those are people who are actually geeking out and really interested in your content. But there is that great middle point where people are having to make that decision. Um, so to repeat your question, the principles of Homago, how do I, how do I advocate for that within my institution? And um, I talk about the creative process, and I say the creative process is an experimental process. Um, I say we should allow that kind of experimenting to happen for teens and not necessarily always have them, not always make institutional directives about the ways that they should be behaving. Um, it just doesn't work to keep that audience there. Um, our institution is invested in having teens in this space. Um, it, it's, it's very, um, it looks good. It looks good. So I, I thank God for that, you know, it helps. Um, but I also would just say that it's, uh, it's also, you know, it's our future funder base, it's our future visitors that are coming. It's also the changing kind of demographics of the nation, to be honest. We, the people who are funding museums now and the people who are on boards of museums now will look very different in the future. Very well said. Um, I am going to now bring up our third panelist, Sandra, uh, who I knew from her work in New York, um, but of course, uh, for many of you, any of you from Seattle know her work uh, here at the Seattle Art Museum. And then, um, yeah, and then I hope we do have time for, for some conversation, but we'll also be here um, after. So. Make sure I don't tumble off the stage. Are you guys still awake? <laughs> That, I mean, that is not a commentary. They are amazing. Oh, yes, it is. That oh, was yes, so it is. crazy. Um, edit that out uh, for any of you live listeners out there. Um, uh, so I'm actually not going to talk about case studies. Um, I'm not going to talk about very much. I'm just going to, as I get to the end of the presentation, I'll show you some pretty pictures because, you know, you're right. Pretty is good, um, but we also know that underneath pretty, sometimes there's a lot of grit, grit, right? And so, um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But I'm going to start by um, by just saying that um, uh, I'm going to talk about how we infiltrate museums um, and uh, with this kind of stuff uh, and how we uh, how to actually make it happen. Uh, so many times we can talk about like, you know, yeah, we have these collaborative teams and they're wonderful and they're amazing and that paragraph looks so fantastic in a proposal. But the reality is that some of that is really painful. And I mean that in all seriousness. I could smile and say, oh, it's really painful and we all laugh, but some of it is really truly painful because some of it is truly about who has agency and who doesn't. And when you don't feel like you have agency or the reality is that you don't actually have agency, then it, um, it kind of feels disempowering and it is disempowering. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you get that. Um, so the other thing I will say is that um, just quickly where I work, I work at the Seattle Art Museum. It's a stone throw from here. You could walk there. I can tell you the path. You can walk through a cool house building, down a hill, walk past another really interesting place where you take a peek at the creator's hand, um, and that's called the Puget Sound. And then another block over, you will find the Seattle Art Museum. Um, where we have a powerful show on view right now called um, uh, L, Women Artists from the Centre Pompidou. If you, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I love that. A little commercial. Um, 
So, um, so a couple of things. One is that I think that the, um, the biggest thing that you'll hear, I think, throughout this tiny, quick presentation, which is going to be rapid fire, is that, um, is that I think that um, agency is, can be in the hands of whoever really wants it. I think that um, the custodians of agency have to be good caretakers of it, so custodianship is really important. I think that um, spaces are just spaces, galleries, adjacent spaces, and I also want to say that I think that people in education and programming are really the first to be thrown the neglected bone of a space. And so um, they do the most creative things with them. So when someone says that education doesn't want to work with technology or curatorial or whatever, actually you should look at them and go, wow, I should work with them because they actually make something out of nothing with less resources than anyone else. I thought I saw someone smile over there. Um, and I think that what's really incredible is that you can make something look really glossy um, out of hardly anything. So this very truthful statement about, yes, this space costs a lot of money at the Hirshhorn. And to do this in this incarnation takes a lot of resources. But the reality is that you could actually do this with probably a fraction of this. Um, so the Seattle Art Museum, oh, I should go back one side. Um, just so I can do my institutional duties. Seattle Art Museum is one museum, three locations. Um, if you haven't been to the Olympic Sculpture Park, you cannot leave here. It is like going to Paris without seeing the whatever, dot, dot, dot. Um, and, um, and so make sure you go and visit. There's the, um, it's a 9.5 acre sculpture park that you can see from any plane flying in. Um, here you have the um, Asian Art Museum, a late Art Deco building with an incredible series of exhibitions on view right now. If you are interested in Ramayana or Indian art, go there. Um, and then to the left is our most recent um, expansion, and um, it is double the size it initially was. It was a Venturi building, and now it's a Clofal building added onto it, and so you should go there. Okay, infiltration. 12 steps to infiltrating a museum with good ideas. <laughs> um, this is me when I was a kid. Um, whenever people put these pictures up, that's when people go, ah. Um, I only show you this picture because I think that when we're kids, we actually have some very clear ideas about the world. Um, or we have expectations about the world, and then over time we start to take on behaviors that we feel um, or we learn are the quote unquote social norms. Then as you get older, you start to realize that the innovators and creative people or the people that are mentioned in the Tipping Point book are the people that have gone back to being their kid self. Right? And so what I find interesting is that whenever I think about this picture, I think about all the things that I thought were cool in the world, and I think about how, wow, the stuff that I thought was cool is the stuff that I strive to create now. And over time, you know, I've gone to graduate school, and I've worked in a ton of museums, and I've been around really smart people. And so that word has taken on, you know, new meaning. It has copacetic. You know, it's the same thing. Um, over time, it's dope depending on if you're in my age demographic, you say, that's dope, that's interesting. If you're from another country, then you might have said something else, like fresh, fly, or a host of other things, like that's sweet um, is another way to say cool. Um, that's easy, she's easy. We're interesting, because you know, all of our work is about language, some of the tension between groups that are working between education and curatorial and in technology or whatever. Somehow we oftentimes don't see those things merging, but oftentimes it's a language barrier. And so sometimes we're all talking about what's cool, but we don't say it the same way, right? And so when I was talking to my brother, um, this was a while ago, and, um, and he was saying that, oh, this woman, she was 100. Well, he didn't say it that way. He said, she's 100. Like, she's 100%. <laughs> um, or, you know, that's a dime right there. Like, that's a 10. Um, and so he and I were speaking different languages. The one word that we did have in common, the two words were cool and swag, right? So that's like the hip cool word now. It's like, oh, she's got swag. Meaning swagger. You know how to... I feel like I'm like in translation right now. Um, but the reality is that 
all of this coolness, all this interesting stuff, when you see, you know, Coltrane playing his instrument, like you're looking at someone who has a certain cool confidence and interest in being just simply who he is and committed to his practice. And so there's a simple, simple kind of interest in integrity and grace. And so when I'm thinking about this work and we're talking about our audiences and how to get stuff done, you know, I also think about people like Miss Piggy. <laughs> who when I was a kid, she was super cool. She had certain interests. She had like this cool green dude hanging on her arm all the time. And she really, really, really had like an incomplete and utter like red eye infatuation with him, right? You don't remember like the parties and stuff where she would get dressed up and I might be dating myself here no, a little no, bit, no, but, no. Um, but the reality is that she knew that that's what she wanted. And I think sometimes we forget our Miss Piggy moment where we know what we want, you know, where we actually forget that there is that end of the road. And so then I think about the other person that I thought was cool and interesting, and I think about JJ, you guys know Good Times? Okay, so this is the first visual artist I think I ever saw in the public realm, right? Um, the artist that, that he's showing the work of is Ernie Barnes, football play, great football player, whose work was like this. Um, and so a lot of people know this work. Um, so when I think about this idea of cool, I also think about stuff that's familiar to me. Those things were familiar to me. I think, I think about my mom, and I think about the thing that I would hear her talking about in the kitchen when I wasn't supposed to be there, you know, or I was there, she knew it, but I was not supposed to be participating or hearing any of it. Um, and her biggest thing was, with her friends, creating moments where you had to be there. She didn't say creating moments when you had to be there, <laughs> um, but she would say, girl, you had to be there. Right? And the only things I ever want to go and talk about in life are the things where I feel like that other person had to be there. Whether it's a meeting, which is rare, um, I have to say. Or it's an event, or it's a conversation, or it's the dialogue we had this morning after the morning keynote speech. I mean, all of that is like, oh wow, you missed it. And so I'm always trying to think about those moments where my mom said that, when she went to see you know, Marvin Gaye and Teddy Pendergrass play in San Francisco at the Fillmore. Like, what is it about that? And then I think about how I go to work and I forget about that. So then I think about like, other people who, like, in terms of style and grace and that cool factor, that thing where they're not trying too hard. It looks easy. The geeking out and hanging out, the truth of the matter is, hanging out is the actual geeking out part. But we need another term to describe it because that makes people believe it, right? And so that's the thing that's most interesting. How do we make people believe and that the thing that we are offering is the thing that really meant the most to them? Like they really want to be there. So this woman was my first teaching artist. She was a dance teacher. She taught ballet and jazz and a whole bunch of other stuff at the local community center. All I know is that her name is Pam. And she introduced me to this person, who was who? Angela Davis. Angela Davis. And it was all about the Afro. So it was like her subversive way of getting a six-year-old to connect with a political figure. And she told me about these events and all this stuff, right? So then I think about, OK, so how do I take all of that and translate it into a museum? So what happens when I go to work and I just forget all the stuff that I'm most interested in, what pulled at my heartstrings, what made me want to tell somebody about this thing. And I think about like, wow, there needs to be a theory of change. There needs to be something where we stop being in this fierce base space and where it's kind of like us against them. I get into it too. I mean, and I'm, I curate in modern and contemporary art. So I'm on both sides of the fence. But I truly do get into the space and I'm like, no, we're not taking that. My staff, staff is here, and I, I, they know I'm always like, you better woman up, girl. Go into that meeting. You know? Why'd you let that happen? You know, Say something. And the reality is that a lot of it is based on fear, right? So much of it is, I don't want this to be sounding like no self-help group up in here, but the reality is that that is the truth. Some of it is truly based on fear of not being right or being called out or someone going to someone else. So how do we move from a fear-based situation to something that's self-assured? Um, how do we move from a place of scarcity to a place of abundance? Like, it's not we're competing. We're, we're all in this together. 
And don't just say it, but like, oh, can you come to this meeting before you even are told you need to invite someone to something? The other thing is like, let's think both little and big. Those two things don't have to be like, this group gets the little budget, this group gets the big budget. I'm thinking, okay, I got a little budget, but you have a big budget, how much of that can I get? Um, should I say that again? <laughs> right? So your budget is my budget. The other thing is that this I, we, like, okay, let's, sometimes it is I, but sometimes we hold onto our program so much where we go into our meetings with my program is such and such. And I, da da da, and my kids, and my program, and my this, and can you imagine? Okay, so yes, that's squarely in Sandra's camp. That's her program. That's Tasia's this. That's right. Susanna's this. Because you have told everyone, it's mine, mine, mine. I'm shaping this space. And so when you do, I'm speaking, I'm talking about myself here. When I do that, it, when I have done that in the past, I actually have come to terms with the fact that I'm actually creating something that I'm blaming someone else for creating. That's, I'm just sorry, I'm just telling you what I think. Um, <laughs> so this 12-step thing, someone asked me, an architect here came to me and he said, you know, well, from Olsen Kundig Architects, my friend Alan, they actually are amazing architecture firm here, a little plug for them. And they said to me, well, Sandra, um, he was like, you know, why do you think the way you do? Well, I mean, what is it about, like, what, what makes you think the way you do? Why you act the way you do? And so I said, well, there are 12 steps, I think. I didn't say this initially. I was like, okay, that's an interesting charge. Then he was like, come and present to us. And I was like, oh, I actually need to put this in, like, writing. So I said, well, what if there are 12 steps? And so here are what I think are the 12 steps. I think that in order to do the stuff that I just talked about, I think that you have to prepare the space. All this is stuff is common sense, though. This is the stuff I learned at home and in other places or from friends or whatever I witnessed somewhere. And there's tons of research to back it up, so I can share that with you as well. But, um, but just in a very basic backbone way, prepare the space. Who, why, what, when, and so what? And so that. Why did, should we be doing this? Okay, you, we, I, I can do a really good job. I'm pretty convincing. I can do a really good job of like, making people believe what I say. And people are down the road, but that, they, I'm like, don't you want to know, so that what? I've told you why, I've told you how, I've told you all that stuff, but so what? Why, why? I mean, what, so, why are you doing this, so that what? And sometimes we don't have to ask the so what, and I think it's important to like really prepare the grounds and prepare the space. The other thing is that I think you have to be intentional. Like from the beginning, like why are you asking these teams what they want? Why are you asking them for their ideas? Are you gonna do something with it? Are you gonna come back and tell, did you set some parameters for them to kind of be with them? Because you know what, if they said, we were talking earlier, I was like, I've heard the craziest things. I really, really want the artists that you bring to town, all of them, they need to come and have dinner in our community. Is that realistic? I've also heard the reverse, which is, oh, actually, yes, they would love to come out. Then you get back to the museum and they're like, I don't know what to do. I'm like, why'd you tell them that they could come out? But that's what we do. We set up these false expectations and lose confidence. The other thing is that um, we want to make sure that we find the choir and, and the disciples and distribute the leadership. I'm like, I want you to like and want this as much as I do. I want you to go out and tell everybody about this because you think it's actually helping you achieve your goals. And it is. But why am I having to convince everyone to do stuff? Change that model. I think the other thing is developing rules of engagement and reciprocity. Okay, what do you want? I can't give you that. Okay, you want the other thing? Oh, great. Okay, so then I can get this too. But I do definitely want something from you. I'm not bankrupting myself of what I need. And when I say I, I mean the big we, the museum, because it's not about you just doing something for me. It's about Sam, because when I leave, you still got to work with Sam. The other thing is fly under the radar. You said that like 18 times, and yeah. I was like, yes! Because sometimes we get out there and it's just like, oh, we're launching a new initiative, hoorah! And then all of a sudden you have nothing to show for it because you've come out too early. Um, let your hair down. Let it down. Seriously. Everything is not that serious. <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay to like have, lose a little of your agency and also, share, take some from someone who actually should be giving it away. Um, create an ecosystem. And by ecosystem, I mean true codependence. Like if, this, if, if, if you don't give this to me, I'm gonna fail. 
if you don't give this to me, we will fail as an institution. And if I don't give this to you, that is super vulnerable. And museums like to be all pretty and nice and cleaned up, you know, and we don't do that. And so that's a great way to create a, a relationship. The other thing is like send the disciples, oh, recruit the unusual suspects and send the disciples. Don't just work with the breakdance kids. Work with the kids that are in the substance abuse program who are like the worst kids in the world that people are talking about. They ain't really the worst kids in the world, but that, that, that. <laughs> um, anyway, so then um, I have time constraints, sorry. Um, then uh, send the disciples, talk to people. Tell them to go out and talk to people. Like have them know the message though. Um, market internally and externally. I think that there is nothing lost on bringing people along inside of your institution. Like get people fired up inside. The worst thing people uh, I find um, challenging is when I hear about something that's happening at, my, at the institution I work at outside somewhere and I'm kind of like, wow, that's interesting. Good to know. You know, um, the other thing is look at the facts, the data that they were presenting. That is so important. Dra data driven decisions are important and throughout on an ongoing basis. I think that's really important. Um, and then finally, I would say, don't forget your mission. I think that that is super important. We get so caught up in the bells and whistles, particularly when it comes to technology and experiential learning that we actually forget to look back at why can't why does this need to happen here and why can't it happen at the YMCA? Um, the final thing is that I'm just going to flip through these pictures really quickly. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so this whole had to be there. I think um, my mother is, I, I think my whole career is built on this idea of creating moments that people have to be there. And so curating like really rich, deep experiences. And so I think that people, you can do that by knowing that in all these cases, people want to see it. They want to do it. They want to share it. They want to repeat it over and over and over again and create. And you have to make it such that they want to do it over and over again. And it doesn't have to be in that order. I'm going to flip through these sides. We did projects with Nick Cave. Um, you guys know his work. We set the city on fire in a great way with um, sound invasions, the museum. This is at 1160, 1162, 1150 at night. And people wanted to sit down and listen to this man speak and listen to this artist play in the galleries. Um, so people want to participate. They want to be engaged. We have something called My Favorite Things Tours where we don't know what people are going to talk about. They, I mean, we've invited our critics into the museum and, they, and given the entire editorial team of a, of a newspaper all the power, we have no idea, and they go through the galleries. Um, so what happens is that if doing those things kind of set up camp in your, if, if you allow those participatory engaging activities to set up camp in your institution, and you start to change how you behave in the organization, this is just my belief, that this, kind, this is kind of physically what your organization can look like. Um, and it can look like this because when people feel like this and they experience this, they start to tell everyone. We have people that are like, I can't, I think they're like, I can't remember what we call them, Tasia, like tweeter, tweeters at the, um, they twit, they twit. <laughs> <laughs> they tweet at our, um, at our events, they're guest tweeters. And so they, they're here, they're at the museum, they're like lobbying for it. Um, and, and if you look here, these are like pictures. This is in the window of Nordstrom's. And these are people taking pictures. Our staff didn't have to do anything. They just, it was just like. And one of the artists we work with, Donald Byrd, who's a dancer, he said that people took out their, um, their cell phones at, and like all the women with the Prada bags like took out their cell phones and they were like. <laughs> And so um, I'm just going um, to show you these. This is the Astor Gates, um, an amazing artist that we had the privilege of working with. I curated a show of his work at the museum. And after installing this project, we did an archive of all, this, um, all these albums that he collected from Dr. Waxer Record Store, had performances, um, DJs, installations. We collected all of the ephemera. Now he's using that in other projects. Um, the other thing is that we did a project with Olsen Kundig Architects called the Record Store Offsite, away from the museum. And an info, it was like a kind of pop-up record store, but it stayed for several months. We had performances, projects, et cetera, et cetera. And this is kind of the, what happens as a result of that. And so analog ends up meeting digital. And now we're in the um, stages of producing the record, which is an album, where people are talking on it in response to the show. So anyway, and if you'd like to share your story about our upcoming exhibition, you should do it online. <laughs> Um, 
No, so good. So what I'd love to do, I think, is to open up questions first, well, just from what we've just heard from Sandra. Does any, would anyone like to ask a question um, that maybe relates to this idea of interrogating the process of what can be done, or at least the ways that these things are being asserted in museum walls, or any questions? Please. Do you want to go first? Or I, 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 I can explain the slides. No, I think Sandra <laughs> oh, first. Oh, for you. Mind. Okay. okay. I, don't, I think you can go. Okay. okay. Boy, for. <laughs> no, go. Okay. Um, you might have to stand up. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to stand up. Uh, I'm going to kneel. Um, hey. So, uh, yeah, that's what the slides look like. But I also have to say that uh, we've been finding that the most local kids are from Anacostia. Um, that can come to the space during our drop-in hours, and that the, there is a diversity of all, the, um, of all the districts and the wards in DC represented when we do workshops, because it has to do with um, families that plan and families that are like working, busy, kids go out and do something, you know? Um, so I, that's how I look at it. Um, I'm not looking at it in any other way, except that that's how Th those are the people who are coming into our drop-in program. And then when we do workshops, it's very different. During the summer, we do these workshops. And um, you know, Maryland, Virginia, DC, they're all, everyone's represented. I haven't developed a theory about it, but that's just what we've been noticing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I'm understanding your question to be, is there a correlation between unstructured programs and ethnicity? Well, that's a refinement of the question based on what Brian said. I was more generally saying, is, is there something about these kind of the, the way we, we construct this approach that affects the ethnicity of hmm. That's a really interesting question. So we have, uh, I was just going to show you, um, we have a program called Remix. And if you're around this Friday night, you should come. Um, but it's it's. An, an entire explosion of activity at the museum throughout the entire building. Seattle is predominantly white. So this is, the, our audience looks dramatically different yeah. based on the demographic look. We have to work really, really, really hard to physically cross boundaries. And so the idea that, um, so, so the idea that hanging out um, is associated with a certain ethnic populations is not, um, not necessarily, I don't think it correlates here. I think it's based on how people behave. I think there may be some generational shifts. We have a program called Remix that I think is, um, that I just mentioned, and what's happened, it was meant to uh, um, address 18 to 35 year olds. Because people went home and told so many of their moms and their, their mom's <laughs> friends and their older folks, the demographic shift is now reflective of like, 50% older people above that demographic, and that's all relative. I mean, I'm not 35. <laughs> um, so, so it's, it's yeah, well, <laughs> thank you. But I guess to your point, I mean, I think that it's, um, I mean, in terms of psychographics and those kinds of things, I think people, um, I personally think, and in terms of the research, people are doing things based on how they socially and intellectually wish to engage. And our research over the last four years with the Wallace grant we had tells us that people really, really, really want intellectual rigor and also social interaction. The balance of the two is super important. So. And I'm also saying that, and, and for me, the informal programming and the workshops both have intellectual rigor. It just looks different. It looks different. Yeah.
I can talk about it. <laughs> I, there was a, you know, I missed a lot of my points because I got kind of nervous up there. And I just like sitting down. It's like I'm an informal educator to stand up in front of a podium. I'm telling you, I, my mind goes blank. It's the worst. Um, but that all said, um, uh, we, have, we have a credentialing program that we use because we're really interested in professional development for these teens too. And so in order for them to use any high-end equipment, they have to go, they have to work with a mentor, um, they have to take a workshop and then they get tested. And um, it's not like a school test, it's they have to, sh through what they can do, show that they know how to handle the, the, the equipment, but also that they can actually teach it to someone else. So that is our credentialing system that we have for our sound booth and for our, um, our digital cameras. Um, and, our, our, and our video equipment. That said, there's also a whole badging trend going on that's cuckoo right now. Um, and it's great, it's great, I love it. Um, and there, there's, this is a whole giant conversation, but to say that we, we will be going towards that, but we will be making it workshop specific as opposed to a part of our programming just because it, it uh, makes more sense for how, how we work with our, our teens that way. Yeah. Did you want? I mean, I, I think most of us could probably talk about badging, whether or not, I think right now what we're really interested in is like, how do you, how do you create, there, you could go for badging, but there are all these other opportunities as well. And so it's just a choice that we haven't decided to join in in that, that way, if you will. Yeah, we have to talk about the usefulness of it. If everyone uses it, great. But if only a few people are using it, will it be recognized and authoritative, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think it's a great segue into this larger conversation of decoupling accreditation and achievement or trying to get away from these more traditional um, methods of mastery. And I think that's where the larger conversation starts to explode. I mean, there are also conversations about are we creating a sense of competition that may not, necessar that may not be necessary right. and or possibly unhealthy. And so, but at the same time, you want a merit system, but it's just, a, it's a quandary, right? Yeah. But, but there's also, I mean, I can go, but there's also something to be said for someone getting credit for having a single parent and having to take care of a sibling, you know? Mm -hmm. That those are, there's some job skills there yeah. that need to be recognized even if they're not through an internship with an important organization mm -hmm. or have done in schoolwork. There are social things that are just as important in 21st century um, job situations that, that than, there, than there are, you know? And the fact that these types of badges could end up in a young person's LinkedIn profile and that's as complicated as it gets, I mean, this is also really quite important, um, which is a good plug for MCN Pro, by the way. We're definitely gonna do badging with that, thought I'd mention. Um, I'm gonna bring it back home because um, I am so thankful to our panelists to be able to um, provide such a provocative conversation um, on, on this topic. And the last maybe just um, minute I would take to uh, talk about some of the assumptions that I'm moving forth now in my practice as an educator and that um, I remind, like keep my inspiration where these types of conversations are happening. Um, that edupunk, that questions of equality, possibility, and culture are already tied up with power and with capital. This is the one forward. Um, and that in my definition, and I think in many definitions of edupunk, um, that if it's about people, then thinking about the intersection of spaces where culture and capital collide offers new possibilities for the roles of museums in education. I'm going to leave it there, um, and thank you all so much for being at this session.